Hello, my name is Benjamin Olmos de Aguilera, and our group chose to talk about the physical limitations of encryption. So what is encryption? Encryption comes from the, word, uh, from the Greek word cryptos, which means hidden or secret. And basically what encryption is, is a way to cipher plain text into cipher text. And in order to read it, we would have to do the opposite. We need to decrypt it. So basically what that means is you have a message and you do something with it so that it no longer becomes readable by humans or computers. And so to decrypt it, you need a, a certain technique, a certain way, or a key of some sort to turn that message that is unreadable back into the original readable message. So uh, encryption goes way back to the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Spartans, the Romans. They all used it. Uh, what Egyptians would do is they would write non-standard hieroglyphics, and nobody could really read hieroglyphics back then. So that was enough to encrypt their messages. What Spartans would do is they would write their messages in leather and wrap it around sticks, and so when you laid the, the leather flat, you wouldn't be able to tell what it says at all. But if you had a stick of the same radius and you wrapped the leather around it, you would be able to see what the message says. What the Romans would do is they would use the Caesar shift cipher. And basically what this means is that you would take a message and you would shift every letter by a certain amount of characters. So if you chose the number 2 and the, the letter was A, the letter would now be C. And you would do this for all letters in the entire message. Um, but nowadays, encryption and decryption has taken a further step due to the Internet of Things. Now we have to use really complicated algorithms and techniques to decrypt and encrypt uh, information so that it, it stays secure because nowadays you have information going through the internet and, and it can be intercepted by anybody and our information can be exploited. And so I'm going to pass this over to Piero who's going to talk to you a little bit more about the different techniques and uh, algorithms used to encrypt and decrypt information. Hello everyone, my name is Piero Caceres and I will be talking to you about the evolution of encryption. And uh, as Ben mentioned earlier, he told you what encryption is. I'll be focusing on how encryption has evolved from the 70s to now. Uh, within that time, it, uh, encryption was known as modern encryption. It followed, uh, it's usually started right after World War II, after the mechanical encryption. Uh, a famous machine known as uh, Enigma used mechanical encryption to uh, encrypt and decrypt information. I'll be discussing about the DBS, the triple DBS, AEF, and RSA encryption, which leads into the conversation of what is symmetric and asymmetric encryption. So, um, DES encryption was uh, was the first publicly accepted algorithm. Uh, it was developed in the 70s, and it used a 56-bit key length. Now, what that means is that you had a possibility of generating two to the, uh, two to the 56 power key, or about 72 quadrated key. Now, at that time, computers were still early development, and it wasn't a very common possible item, so they thought that no one would ever be able to generate all these keys. And that only happened, or that only lasted until 1988, where uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation took it upon themselves to see if they were able to generate all these keys. And they were able to do it due to a simple law known as Moore's Law, which states that uh, the processing power of a computer doubles every 18, to, uh, every 18 months to two years. And in 1998, with two thousand dollars worth of equipment and in three days, they were able to generate all the keys. And since DES encryption uh, relied on all these keys, and now that everyone would be able to have them, they moved on to what they thought would be the next form of encryption. That next form of encryption was known as triple DES encryption. And what triple DES encryption did was um, it got the DES key, it encrypted it once, it encrypted it twice, until it encrypted it three times. And after you had the three, uh, after you encrypted it three times, that was the key, and that was the data that you were uh, encrypting. And although concept-wise or logic that you think, oh, I encrypt the data three times, there's no way they'll be able to get their hands on it, that didn't really get picked up. And at the same time, you had the uh, triple DS encryption, you had AES encryption, and AES encryption used this new form known as substitution permutation. And that relied on a fixed 128 uh, block bits and a 4 by 4 matrix. And what that did was they got the, the 128 uh, plain text block, you added the key to it, and then uh, within 10 levels it would encrypt using the byte step encryption. And as you can see in the image to the right, you after running those 10 rounds, you got your cipher text block. Now, if you run it backwards, as you can see to the right side of the diagram, going back, I added the key, and then going on those 10 rounds, you end up back with your plain text block, and that is how you would use AES to decrypt it. And parallel to AES encryption, we have RSA encryption. Now, RSA encryption uses a form of encryption that relies on keys. And these keys are, one is public, and the other one is private. 
can you use these uh, this program encouraging to transmit data via the internet? And what this does is um, the public key is given out to the general audience, general public, all the users, and the private key is kept uh, kept hidden, or you keep it to yourself. And the the end user gets the public key. They encrypt their data. They send it to you. And with your private key, you're able to decrypt that data that's sent to you. And then you go ahead and if you have to send that user some information, you encrypt it with your private key and they decrypt, uh, they decrypt it with their, the public key that they have. So, like I said, uh, this led into the conversation of symmetric encryption. And symmetric encryption uses uh, one key to, encry uh, to encrypt and decrypt uh, data, messages, anything that you have encrypted. Um, the good thing about symmetric encryption is that it is it's very fast and it doesn't rely on a lot of resources like your system or a computer. But the downside is that this one key does both the encryption and decryption. And with that, you have to keep this key safe. Uh, if this key were to get exposed, caught into a hand, or, or you just suspect that it's it's uh, it's been become it's been made available, you're gonna have to generate a new key. The reason why is because your data is now um, become vulnerable. And with that, every time you suspect that this key has been made public, the new key is gonna be uh, generated. Now asymmetric encryption uh, took care of it. And the way they did it was having two separate keys. One key given to the general audience, the user, and new key uh, the private key. And if we follow the diagram to the right, we have an encrypted source, which gets encrypted with the public key, and then you get an encrypted result. That encrypted result is then sent to the end user, who will decrypt it using the private key. And from the private key, you generate back the data in the text, and you're able to read the message. Now, uh, since we are using two keys, uh, it is very resource intensive with uh, on the system. But the beauty about it is that, as you can see from the third bullet, the public key does not equal the private key. So what we mean by that is, since we have made the public key available to everyone, um, these keys are separate entities. Okay? You cannot reverse engineer the public key to get uh, to get the private key. So, and with these two keys, we're able to form to uh, a form of authentication because the public key can only decrypt what was encrypted with the private key, and the private key can only the private key can only decrypt what was encrypted from the public key. So this is how you can communicate back and forth and know that um, that the information was sent from the right person because these key can only decrypt each other's information. And I will now pass it on to Maria who is going to discuss and talk about the OSM. So I'm going to be talking about database, mobile, and web encryptions. So for databases, there is algorithms and level. So there's a symmetric algorithm, the fully database encryption, OS and file system encryption. For the fully database encryption, it is not recommended just for the simple fact that it does not have access control. Well, it has it, but it has kind of a lack of access control, performance impact, and limited key management. For the OS and file system encryption, it's in the same boat as the fully database encryption, just for the simple fact that it doesn't have good key management. What's really recommended is middleware. So middleware does have the access control, limited performance impact, and has a clear text communications of what should be encrypted. SQL servers, Microsoft provides a general rule as to encrypting SQL servers, so I'll get a little bit more into that. SQL encryption general rules, these are the seven general rules provided by Microsoft, are really good to have, especially when you are going to encrypt an SQL server. Next is key management. Key management is very important, just for the simple fact that a lot of encryptions do use keys that pretty much managing that is like I said important but what's cool is that there's something called always encrypt so pretty much what always encrypt is designed to protect sensitive data that is stored in like a server database so it allows clients to encrypt sensitive data inside client applications which is really cool and never reveal the encryption keys to the database engine so like the SQL server or the SQL database results of this Always Encrypt provides a separation between those who own the data and those who manage the data. So for mobile device encryption, everyone has iPhones, Androids, Google has a new phone too. So what's cool with this, I'm going to use Apple as an example. Apple uses file system hardware and software encryption. 
So how they do it is that the file system is written to flash memory and contains both the operating system and like your data. And so what they do is they scramble that data that is written to flash and then unscramble anything back later that is read, read into main memory. So that's a little bit of an example of mobile device encryption. So they do use file system hardware and software. Next is a web server encryption. So we have something called SSL and TSL. So they use outbound and inbound. There is a key generated that consists of private key and a public key. The private key is placed in its web server key store, whereas the public key is placed in a digital certificate. So you can kind of see it here, a little model of how everything is a little bit encrypted, encrypted session key, service operation to receiver. So here is a little bit different. Here you have the same, the private key is placed to a web server, key store, and the public key gets placed to a digital certificate. But for inbound encryption, for that type of process, the partner contacts using a secure HTTPS URL. So in terms of key management, it is necessarily similar, but the actual processing is different. Hey everyone, my name is Maria Paula, and I will be presenting to you the OSI model and the TCP IP model. The first layer we'll be talking about is the application layer, which is layer seven of the OSI model. This layer is responsible for end user processes and applications. Within this layer, security protocols are identified and user authentication is conducted. Next is the presentation layer. This layer is responsible for converting information received by other layers, which is the application and session layers, and relaying that information into a readable format. Like this, compatibility problems are resolved. The end user authentication that we spoke about in the application layer also occurs within the presentation layer. Uh, within the presentation layer, it is encrypted and sent to the next layer for further breakdown before arriving at its destination. Session five is responsible for establishing, managing, and terminating connections between applications or network hosts. Besides this, the network layer is also responsible for name lookup, security functions, destination, and starting point information, placement within packet headers, and data synchronization between senders and receivers. The transport layer is concerned with enabling communication, specifically delivery of messages between applications and network hosts. Within this layer, reliable fragmentation and reassembly occurs. The transport layer also guarantees data delivery, conducts game resolutions, controls data flows, performs error detection and recovery, and lastly, verifies access to the network for host applications. On the network, the most common transport layer protocols are TCP, IP, and UDP. The operation of the network layer encompasses the routing of information through the network. In addition to this, the network layer assigns network and service addresses, conducts packet switching, error detection, and congestion control, and routers are the physical components that are present at the network layer. The next layer, the data link layer, which is the second to last, it provides a form of transfer and validation for data passing between two physically connected nodes, which means that the two com computers or the host and the destination computer are on the same network. The data link receives information from the network layer and structures these packets into, of data into frames. The frames that are output are then transmitted to the physical layer, which we'll be talking about now. The physical layer, the physical layer of the model deals with the bit level transmission between the networks. Bit level streams are the pulses of light or electricity that represent zeros and ones on the physical wire. This layer also handles voltage changes, data rates, and calculation of maximum transmission distances. So now that we've talked about the OSI model, let me introduce you a little bit to the TCP IP model. Here you can see the differences between the OSI model and the TCP IP model. As opposed to the seven layers that comprise the OSI model, the TCP IP model is made up of four, a four layer structure. Both the ISI mod OSI model and the TCP IP model have the same goal in mind, which is to have a conceptual representation of networking and standardize the whole process of data transfer. The layers of the TCP IP model are broken down between the application layer, transport layer, internet layer, and network layer. The application layer of the TCP IP model is made up of the application presentation and session layers of the OSI model. The transport layers of both models line up and serve the same purpose. The internet layer of the TCP IP model, much like the network layer, is responsible for the routing of information throughout the network, the internet layer of the TCP IP model packs data into data packets known as IP datagrams. IP datagrams, addre IP datagrams addresses are used to forward data between hosts and across networks. And lastly, the network layer of the TCP IP model encompasses how data is physically being sent over the network, just like the physical layer of our OSI model. Hi, my name is Nicholas David. Now when it comes to the physical layer of encryption, 
data is usually stored in ones and zeros, and the one is represented by electric charge and zero by the lack of an electric charge. The structure of ones and zeros depends on the type of data, and across the world file types tend to become universal, such that if the data is plain text it could be identified and read from, but if it's encrypted it is a jumbled mess until it's decrypted and you can't make sense of it. Now data can be in a couple of places. It could be data at rest, in motion, or in use. At rest, examples are typically hard drives, flash drives, CDs, and other kinds of permanent media. The risk of not having data encrypted when it's at rest is that those mediums can be lost or stolen. Encrypting it before storing it and putting it away protects against it being read if it were lost or stolen. Now data in motion is data being transmitted across airwaves or wires or any kind of other physical medium. The public-private key systems are used to protect this kind of data by encrypting it before it travels over this physical medium and decrypting it when it arrives at its destination. A problem with this is that the key initially needs to be transmitted unencrypted and at that point it might be intercepted and, and the person or entity that intercepted the key could compromise further transactions of information using that key. Quantum cryptography could protect against this. And data in use is data that's in use in a computer system. This is data that is currently being worked on, such as data that's been read from permanent storage for use in a software application. Most operating systems do not encrypt this data and rely on permissions within the operating system to prevent access to that data by applications that are not supposed to access it. A developing technique called Rowhammer is a, is a technique used to gain access to protected data by exploiting the physical properties of where it's stored. Uh, the storage mediums for data in use are becoming so small that the physics can be exploited. What Rowhammer does is it essentially claims a piece of memory within the operating system and repeatedly hammers it with ones and zeros corresponding to charges and discharges until the physical space that represents that memory absorbs energy from the spaces around it which means that it's absorbing data from the spaces around it, and since it's not encrypted, it's possible to make sense of it. When it comes to the future of physical encryption, like I mentioned before, quantum encryption could solve the problem of securely exchanging keys. Quantum cryptography is the science of exploiting quantum mechanical properties to perform cryptographic tasks. The best known example of quantum cryptography is the key distribution, which offers an information theoretically secure solution to the key exchange problem. The quantum property is that a quantum measurement cannot be made without modifying what is being measured. When a key is exchanged unsecurely, it can be intercepted. If the key is represented in quanta, intercepting it would change it, thus rendering it useless to an interceptor, because when it's sent to the person that should be using the key to encrypt, if it's intercepted and measured, it will change it. So the interceptor will have a different key than the key being used to encrypt data by who intended to encrypt it originally. This could provide a secure method of key distribution in the future.